So I would like to start on my far left and introduce you to Martin Moll, who's Campaign Mar Magazine's Power 100 Marketer in 2016. I believe that's correct. It is. I, I told them, and they wrote it. Excellent. <laughs> Good plan with the journalism. Um, and a former marketing director of Nissan Europe and Honda. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. But uh, I'm no expert. So any opinions you hear, I do welcome challenges. Of course, I think I'm right, but I'd love to hear I'm wrong, but let's just get it going. So there's nothing worse than somebody going, I to tell you how to solve everything. <laughs> but we can start. Um, we also have here Matt Donegan, CEO of Social Circle, an influencer and marketing platform for brands. So one way of getting that direct conversation going with your customers through the authentic channels. Indeed. To my right, Evan Kiprius. That's right. Okay, Editor-in-Chief of Trusted Reviews, UK-based technology website and YouTube channel dedicated to bringing tech reviews, and I'm fairly certain where my husband spends 95% of his internet browsing time. Good. Yeah. Uh, definitely. definitely. I'm fairly sure <laughs> that by the... By, oh, no, I can tell. Because any time we want to buy technology in the house, it's obsolete by the time he's gone through all the reviews and he has to start to get um, And yeah. last but no least, we have Michael Sherwood, Head of Customer Experience at Atom Bank the one that everyone's telling you to go to because it's customer experience is so awesome. Check, going to be in the post. Um, UK, UK's first bank built exclusively for the smartphone or tablet. So we're going to find out from these four eminent gents how the, we can use the different touch points to impact brand perception. We're going to hear some best practice, maybe not expert practice, but we'll, we'll start with good and work for a way to better and best, shall we? Um, and then hopefully you, the audience, we'll come away with some ideas on how you can tap more into it. I'll do some Q&A with these guys to start with, and then we'd love to open it up to you. You can either stick your hand up in the sky, or we can go all modern, and you can use Twitter to tweet us. <laughs> do we have a, oh, hashtag advocacy economy. They've thought of everything. So yes, if, you, if, you, if you're feeling, feeling a little uh, shy and retiring today, you can do it via Twitter. And we all get to laugh at your Twitter handle. Um, so, first of all, let's kick off. I would love to kick off with Mike, on my right. How do you align your brand customer experience with the changing customer needs? Before I answer that, can I, before um, you saw the agenda and the panelists, um, could you put your hand up if you'd heard of Atom? Right, okay, that's the awareness box ticked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, just um, building on, on, on what my um, core panelists were saying earlier on. I've got one rule for these kinds of things, and it's, you know, when I've left, um, has it been worth the bus fare, right? Because sometimes you come to these places and you take a, a you know, time out of the office, etc., and you don't get much from them. So at the end, I'm going to ask you whether it's been worth the bus fare, and, um, and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll get your satisfaction um, measurement using that, using that measure. Um, so in answer to the question, I guess the first thing is, you've got to be absolutely customer obsessed. So it's not just about being customer focused, it's about being literally obsessed. But that needs to go from the top down. So I'm really, really fortunate that our CEO, um, ex first direct CEO, um, Mark Mullen, um, is customer obsessed. Um, but that's interesting when you join an organization that's a startup and it doesn't have any customers. So we had a great idea, we're gonna build a bank in an app. We went live um, in April 2016 with zero customers. Um, so my job was to immediately put in place a voice of the customer program to understand, you know, had this um, marketing proposition that we built and put out to market um, hit the spot, what did customers think about it? So I'm just gonna tell you that story. So we start, I started with no budget, absolutely no budget. We had a few people on the phone, um, but I'm an operations guy, I'm an operations practitioner, and I've been for 18, 19 years. So I went to the troops on the phone, we got an Excel spreadsheet up and running, and we started to understand why customers were contacting the contact center. And we got some brilliant insight immediately. So we found, first of all, that the average age of our customer was much higher than we thought. Because we went live with a, a savings product, right? And boomers don't have any money. <laughs> no, boomers do have money. Millennials don't have any money. Um, so straight away we started to get feedback that said, right, we've got a bunch of customers in the boomer category that are not necessarily tax, uh, tech savvy and they've got very specific needs. So for example, we launched the app and some of the first feedback we got was, I'm finding it really difficult to maneuver around the app. I don't know how to log out. I don't know how to log in. 
um, I've set up my account and I can't find my account number. Um, I've got biometrics and the biometrics don't seem to be working quite as I expected. So we started to feed all that information back into stand-ups, into the tech guys, and we're literally changing the app week by week. So that was the start of the Voice of the Customer program. So taking the proposition, went live, and feeding the, uh, the information that we're getting back from the contact test straight away. And then I earned the right to go and implement new tools because straight away we were saving money. We were stopping the phone ringing, you know, we were saving, saving um, contacts coming in and, and um, satisfying customers that perhaps you know, had joined Atom but didn't fully understand the proposition. Um, took those savings and then started to roll out the, the, the different voice of the customer touch points. So, um, I then started to say, right, okay, what are we doing on the App Store? Um, and started looking at the App Store rate and, and taking the bit and getting there. And uh, I've got a cracking tool, I'm sure they won't mind me saying this, but um, a company out of Australia, Perth, called AppBot. Um, AppBot, brilli absolutely brilliant tool. So it trolls all the App Stores. Um, obviously, you, you plug in your particular app, but you can also benchmark, it's got sentiment analysis, and you can very quick and it's got AI around the back end that's looking using NLP to look at what customers are saying. So started to feed all that back in. I could then see what the, the type and frequency of the cons both negative and positive were and started to feed that back in, in into the into the business. Um, then started to think right okay we 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 brought out this brand, how we're we gonna get brand awareness. Um, and then started to use the savings to say right okay we're gonna go down the reboot route or we're gonna go down the, the, the trust pilot route. Um, and then gradually over the last what, year and a half, using all that information to um, feed, feed the machine, if you like. So we've got all these customer-focused people that are customer-obsessed. Right, here's the insight that you need to go and make this proposition truly brilliant. Um, so that's the per first part of the story. So we've got all the insight, and then it was a case of, right, well, how are we going to prioritize? So we set up a customer panel. Um, so we've got now 400 active customers on our panel, and they're real customers. Um, so we went out with a marketing campaign to recruit them. We don't pay them anything, so they do it out of, the good, out of the good of their hearts, and because they subscribe to the brand. And then any changes that we're looking to make uh, in the app, we use a tool called UserZoom. I'm sure that those guys won't mind me mentioning their name as well, but we'll come up with prototypes. So we'll take the data, build a prototype, push it out to the panel, um, they can go through that prototype in the comfort of their own home. So they download the app, the user zoom app, bring up the prototype, and then we test the usability of the potential changes that we're going to make. So the changes come back from the inside, go into prototypes, back out to real unpaid customers, so they're not professionals. That we, we, we vet them quite rigorously and make sure that they're not part of any you know, paid panels. Um, then A-B test and sometimes A-B-C test. Um, we've got something called a standard usability measure. So we look at, we give them a task. We say, right, okay. Did they manage to complete the task? Yes or no. How easy was it? Um, and was it a success or no? And then we put those three things together and we come up with a standard usability measure. And then we A-B test them. And if we're going in the right direction, we've got a standard benchmark of 65%. And then if we've got over 65%, you know, chances are it's going to be better than we've got already and then we'll roll that out as a new feature. Um, just it, from a practitioner perspective, really, really simple model that we've put in place. So rolling all that back, step one, really understand what matters to customers. But to do that back from customers, with customers directly in the room, be it virtually or, um, or physically, and then measure the things that really matter. Now a lot of businesses miss, in my, in my experience, they miss first base. So they've prob probably got a good idea of what they think matters to customers, but not many actually go to a panel, bring in their customers, and then we find what matters most. Then once you understand what matters most, and in our, cus in our customer's case it was things like ease, make sure it's really easy, make sure it's really simple and straightforward and easy to understand, um, make sure it's secure, obviously we're a bank, um, and above all, make sure it's good value. So we've got those pillars, and then we measure the things that matter most. Um, from Atom's pers uh, perspective, because we don't have any branches, um, we've got really low cost base, therefore we can take the thing that matters most, the price, and give really, really good rates. We've designed our app so it's really intuitive, really simple, 
we do EI, uh, e, EID and V um, all electronically. So we'll identify the customer without them having to put any forms in. We do all that around the back end. You can register in the app within five minutes and you can take out a savings account with some of the best rates in the country within 10 minutes in total. And then you can track, we predict your, in, your interest going forward and you can see that in the app. So customers said, right, sometimes I'm not really clear in terms of what interest I'm earning. Um, so we built that into the app so we look into the future. Um, so you're really clear in terms of uh, you know, how your money's going to be working for you. So hopefully all that makes sense, but that's a, a whistle stop tour of Appen, but that's how we've built our proposition. Fantastic. That sounds pretty much like a whistle stop tour of how to build an atom. So if anyone wants to rush off now, <laughs> then you've given us all your secrets. And that's really awesome. That's such a, a clear presentation of how you've responded, got hold of the information and then responded to it. But I guess not everyone can respond or, or wants to respond as seamlessly to, to customers' experiences and the changes. I just want to ask the chaps on either side of me, because you, you're sort of the, the channels with the customer, you with Social Surf and, and Trusted Reviews, mm -hmm. and you hear the voice of the customer and whether it's being heard. So when, when companies are asking, do you align, are they even listening to customers? Are they able to listen to customers? I think, well, I think uh, from a social perspective, it's really easy now to have a finger on a pulse of what is being said about your company. You know, you, you, you can start, as you said, you've got a company that, that brings all that information together and measure sentiment, and you can look at that. And the important thing is to really draw themes out of that and find the, the things that really matter, because you're never going to make everyone happy. You're just not going to happen. But find the things that a number of people seem to be suggesting, and then really work hard to, to fix those. I think that's key as well. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, so for us, with the with the social influence, it's just as as important to listen to the comments around the audience as it is from the what the influence is actually saying. So we look at the likes, shares, comments, etc. That, that come back from a sentiment perspective. We tend not to. We've done some AI work around the sentiment analysis, but we actually find that it's being misread massively. Yeah. So context is absolutely everything in that respect. So we, we actually we go, we go through those the, the comment side quite in a quite, quite granular level, uh, and we try to pull out those pos positive sentiments. And we've seen social influence really empowering brands in a way that the the content that's produced, the the, the customers, the 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 brand loyalists will actually want to see that content as the advertiser mm. behind that brand. So there's a there's a huge power behind uh, it, it, behind engaging with an audience and then listening and responding to them, and then you can adapt and change your, your campaign accordingly. Fantastic. I mean, I mentioned earlier that where customers talk about your brand, we we. we think of the customer journey in a very linear fashion. We still do. We think they're going to come, they're going to buy it, then they're going to tell us what they think about it. Evan, I want to ask you in particular, how has the customer journey changed in the past few years and what's that mean for brand marketing strategy? I mean, it, it's changed massively. You, you mentioned it earlier that you used to just go into a shop and ask the, who was, whoever was working in the shop, you know, what, what should I buy, what do you recommend? That's totally changed. There's just so much noise now, whether it's from uh, people like, like me, you know, the, the expert reviews, uh, it's people on Twitter, it's user reviews, um, th there's just a lot of noise. And we did quite a big study where we had about 1,200 people looking at their, their purchase journeys and how they went through that. And we actually found it was, it was like a spaghetti monster. It was, there was no clear linear progression from, hey, I've, I've sparked my, my interest, um, now I'm going to have a look around, uh, all right, I've researched it, I've decided what to buy, and I've gone to buy it. We actually found that people were jumping back and forth, so making a decision, changing their minds, going back to the beginning. We also found that um, there was a lot of people that tended to like going in store and seeing a product physically, and then still going back and buying it online as well. So that there's a lot of that there's a lot of journeys there and it's that there's no one single right path you have to look at the product you're selling as well um, we found that there's there's a, a distressed purchase obviously a thing which is uh, we found 25% of people uh, would buy a TV or a phone as a distressed purchase however that rose to 70 75% 
for a white goods product, so a fridge freezer or a microwave. If that breaks, you know what? You just need to find someone and replace it. And actually, the service then is very important as well. I need it tomorrow. I need it to be fitted tomorrow. I need it working tomorrow. Mm. When it comes to something like a, a complex product, like a TV, where you might be investing and thinking about a bit more of an enthusiast kind of audience, that could take up to three months. So yeah. as you mentioned, mm, yeah. you know, you sit there, you kind of think, you kind of go back. And there's also an element of purchase paralysis there where you kind of go, there's, there's too much, there's too much information, there's too much coming, coming out. We took a drastic step about a year and a half ago to remove comments from our reviews um, because we found that there were people commenting that had no idea, that, that had agendas. Um, so it might be someone who didn't really want this company to sell a product and they would be going, oh no, this is much better, go and have a look at this, this is rubbish. And we had quite a few issues like that. And when we did a lot of user research, we found that as people were reading the review, they, they read it and go, oh brilliant, this is perfect, this is what I'm going to buy. And they got to the comments and went, oh, 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 oh no, 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 I, I don't know what to do now, I don't know what to do. And that was a really big decision. And now what, what we're doing is actually just looking at so using social a lot more to converse with our with our readers and make sure that if they if we've missed something from a review, it's kind of like, okay, you know what, that's a really good point. Let's let's add that, mm -hmm. and that's how we engage now. Fantastic. I'm going to pick up on that point about um, comments chaos and review fandangos in a bit because that fascinates me. But um, Mark, uh, I want to pick on you a little bit from your car history. Pick on me. You pick just on. ask them questions now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. Um, you're, you're a car, car man who gets to be picked on. <laughs> but it's the car industry that interests me because I've been doing a little bit of research and instantly all statistics that I held in my head have gone, so it's going to be a lot of versus a few. Um, there are a lot of customer journeys in the car buying purchase, <laughs> most of which are online. You know, it's no longer sort of trudging from forecourt to forecourt. Yeah. The ads are clearly very, very important. Honda's cog, I don't know if that was specifically your time, but... That was just a groundbreaking... It wasn't. It wasn't. But right on its <laughs> coattails regardless. Um, but, you know, Honda's, Honda's brand really did well from that. But it's today, it's about the advertising plus. It's yeah. about the journey you have, the sites you go to, yeah. the reviews, everything else. How, do you, how can you make that a quality experience using reviews before, as Evan says, it just turns into noise and infighting? It's funny when you were talking before. I, you know, you talk about reviews going to certain sites like TripAdvisor had the thing of the shed, yeah, which yes. was the most yeah. popular restaurant, which wasn't actually a restaurant in the end. It was just the Does everyone the know shed. about that? TripAdvisor oh. got so many reviews that you could game the system. And this guy set up what was it? He was using shaving foam, um, <laughs> took, lots of, fans, <laughs> yes, took yeah. lots of fancy yeah. pictures of shaving foam and bits from his rubbish bin and set them up to look like Nouvelle Cuisine. This is the latest, <laughs> latest uh, restaurant in London. He's based in Dulwich or something. And it was his shed. And it was his garden shed. Yeah. And he got so many reviews. It was like the number six or something chic place to go in London. It's ridiculous. Anyway, sorry. So I that's how I build our strategy. That's why I'm no longer an automotive. However, um, so it's, it's quite a challenge in automotive. So on the one hand, if I'm being bluntly, honest you've got such big budgets there is room to fail with ease because you've got enough that you can play with and that's a real challenge but I well, separately worked in the power division which is really you know it's all things that engines like lawnmowers power equipment um, quad bike etc margins are so tight so you could take an average car that had about six seven thousand profit or I took a, a Nissan GTR uh, GTR which is a sports car that's a hundred grand car 25 grand profit it's not a big seller but it's pure cash you take a lawnmower and it's 41 quid, you know where you sit, it's like running your own bank account. Mm. So suddenly you can't have this sort of large yes approach. So you get really granular. But So one of the challenges is the scale of the budget. The other is everyone's an expert in automotive. Everyone seems to have worked their way through marketing at some point. So everyone's got an opinion. Mm. So it is like a kind of committee consensus environment. That's a really tough challenge. The other major problem is we don't own the vertical. So our biggest, if you imagine this whole industry from R&D right the way down, all that investment comes down to a salesperson in a dealership and a customer. And if one pisses off the other, that's it. The whole lot can crumble. And we don't have enough control in the automotive industry of that experience. And it's the most common experience because out of each of the touch points, there's a lot the automotive, the manufacturers will do in terms of brand advertising, uh, events, sponsorship, whatever it might be. They'll then have a lot of the online content, so they'll sort of deviate between social content will be 
features benefits soul in a positive way that's kind of engaging, that is linked somehow to the overall brand message. And then you'll have your other online portals which are more rational. This is what you know, it's like a DIY manual. And it depends where the users are in the journey. Mm -hmm. But all that's kind of nice stuff. And a lot of it's dysfunctional, I'll come on to that separately. Because everyone has a, an opinion. Multiple agencies all want their stake. They all pretend to get on. No one gets on with anyone else. It's all power games. And they stitch stuff together for clients. And it becomes a real difficult battle between the two. Separate to that, dealers have their own agendas. So it doesn't matter what your mission is as a brand, if a dealer decides they're not going to sell new cars, they're going to sell the used, because they're way off their target, then they will steer customers from one product to another. Mm. And I've seen it live, you know, I've, I've even been in mystery shops. So the, the, other f the biggest flaw automotives have is that you give, manuf manufacturers give car dealers front end margin, which is what they get from the product up front, and they can keep it, retain it, or give it away, but it's back end margin. And a back-end margin is based on variables such as the volume they've got to hit and customer satisfaction. So you are forcing customer satisfaction mm. through that touch point based on, if you don't do it, we financially penalize you. And that's wrong. Inherently, that tells you there is a fundamental flaw mm. with how the process works. So customers can get a variable experience depending on the day of the week, where if dealers are over their target, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. If they're on termination row, et cetera. So it's a, it's a big problem for us. But I've danced around <laughs> a load of subjects. It's a big problem for you, but? Any thoughts but on the subject? I mean, it, you, it sounds like the dealers no, are your what's, customers. No, what's, got really, to what's really interesting about, from a, from a car purchasing decision making, so if I took, so G5, so I'll give you a sort of real kind of short, G5 out of all the cars that are called a car park, which is taxed, insured, presumed used, the annual rotation of volume of sales is no more than 10% ever. So UK sells about two and a half million cars. Well, registered, they don't sell everyone. Some sit in car parks. The car park is over 30 million. So that means there is never more than 10% of people buying in a rolling 12 months, full stop. What happens is manufacturers put all their investment in that product, major launch, brand activity, all communications through every channel is about selling products. 90%, 90% don't give a damn about the purchase. So the dilemma is, well, we're trying to push products. It's only one model, one sector, but 90% don't give a damn. So how does that configure? So so much pressure is on pushing the volume. Brands will tend to create a long-term strategy around the whole life cycle of customer, every channel, over a long period of time between product launch, campaign, uh, brand, business as usual, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, you strip all of that away. If they're missing the sales quarter, everything comes straight back to that. By a prime example, it took me six months to get our budget. So our budget in Nissan, when I was looking after Europe, was 260 million euro. It took me six months to get that set up, media across the whole uh, shebang of all the countries. Six weeks into the first trading quarter, I lost 9% because small cars weren't selling. So everything goes back into short term. So your strategy starts to fall apart. Uh, and it's a bit like going to a tailor and saying, right, here's a cloth, make me a three-piece suit. When they start to cut the material away, you say to manager, it's not going to stack now. I can't give you the ROI and I can't get that return. You then get a load of homework that says, well, that's your job. Make it stretch. So there comes a point where you have paper plans. So what it means is, in every touch point, through every strategy, through every model, and no matter who the customer is, ultimately that all gets kind of pushed away. It just gets driven into the short-term mentality of selling. Mm. And that's difficulty because if businesses were ruthlessly honest, they'd go, do you know what? This customer malarkey is a bit, it's a bit overrated. We just need to move product. <laughs> Automotive, is, Automotive is only one example of that, but they can't go with a mission statement going, right, this is our strategy, fuck the customer. It's about moving that product line because of course they get fired. Yeah. So there's a lot of shit that goes on. There's beautiful charts. And the other problem you have in automotive is everyone has, oh, I've got to think of customer. How do I squeeze customer into the context of what I want to do? And they're called programs. And that means customers are treated as if there's some sort of program. They fit into a sequence. And subject to how close they are to the conversion of sale de determines whether they keep the budget or not. Mm. And that's the sliding scale. So it's a bit of a mess in the automotive industry. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, that does, it does, yeah, goodbye, it does. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and there was your final job interview for the automotive industry. Um, you see my ex-boss at the back. But it does, it does 
beg a question. So we've been talking about how to get the customer to feel positive about the brand and how to make, we're actually putting a lot of the onus on the customer to have a positive um, experience. Can we be using this user journey, can we be using the insight we get from customers to start speaking to our other customers, our stakeholders, our people in the stores, our people in the call centers, our people in the franchises? <coughs> How can we get them to understand the importance of the customer experience? Can we use that info? Are they getting that information, those tweets and those stars? Are they seeing that? Well, or is it only I, the web developers? jump in again, and yeah. then you can, you can me for the, the rest. I think um, from a customer experience, so buying a car is actually a really emotive experience. And then they post rationalize. It's always right. They, the reason I bought that is, and it's the same with a lot of other items. So they love the whole process. Mm. So customers start off three months before they purchase with about nine, 10 products, and they filter it down. So unless you're on that list to start with, then you never end up being the, the car at the end. Once they've bought it and they leave the forecourt, thereafter, any communication, generally speaking, from a manufacturer or dealer, so manufacturers will be trying to tell you when you need your next service, the warranty issue, et cetera, et cetera. Dealers will be trying to sell you a new car. Sometimes they'll forget where you're on a database and they'll try and, and we've seen this, sell you the, this is one of the worst moments in automotive is when they write to a customer about buying a Honda Civic and the customer writes back and says, you've just sold me a Honda Accord weeks mm. ago, what on earth are you thinking of? And it can all get destructive because mm. customers, once they leave the forecourt, consider any other purchase a distress one mm. and it's an expense they don't want. So communicating to them thereafter, it feels like it can be one of those, you know, how are you? How's things? <laughs> How's you spend the day? Got oh, any money left? <laughs> it gets very difficult. So you end up talking about blah, blah, brand stuff. Mm. You know, just stupid stuff on Twitter because people feel they need to pump messages out from the manufacturer's side but they're not really sure who wants to see what and if they give it that. There's a, there's a couple of things you picked up on there that we can kind of run through after. The first thing is authenticity. So your question around communicating back out to the troops mm. uh, and also back out to customers. Right. Can everyone hear my question? Can everybody hear? Shout! Right, <laughs> I'll shout. Um, I was just saying that the first thing is you've got to be authentic and it links back to who you recruit. Right, so you know. I can say this because we're a startup, but we spent a lot of time making sure that we recruited the right people. Um, for me, you're either customer focused or you're not. It really is that simple. Now, if you've got a bunch of people that think customer first, then it's a lot easier. That would be the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say, but just to your point around you know, pushing product, we don't have any targets. Right? Targets, whether they're sales targets, whether they're customer satisfaction targets, we don't have any targets in Atom. Right? That doesn't mean to say we don't have key measures that we work through, but we don't target things like customer satisfaction because it just drives the wrong behaviours and it drives the wrong way of thinking. Um, that would be the second thing I'd say. Then you've got to truly involve your people, right? So customer satisfaction, net promoter score, delivering for the customer isn't just something that exists you know, on the outskirts of the business. Right? We involve the guys in the contact centre, the, they're um, capturing every single reason that a customer calls. You know, and we spent a lot of time with them talking about things like systems thinking, right, and expl explain to the guys on the phones that, you know, you as an individual really, really matter. But actually, it's the system that you work in, right? It's the systems and the processes, right? Is the app working or is it not working, right? And you've got to involve the people to then get the insight, and then you've got to provide the information back to the troops to say this is what we've changed as a result and then it becomes you know a self-fulfilling prophecy so th there would be the three key things that I would Sorry, can I just say. throw in a question that is your business going on through exponential growth yeah do you think because the car manufacturing is not it's a saturated market so everyone's in a kind of decline they're trying to prop it up do you think that wonderful model will change the minute it levels off or goes through some sort of decline no I don't and I, I and I say that with conviction because our chairman um, has the same view, right? That it's not profit then customer, it's customer then profit. Right? And it runs right through the business, from the chairman down to the board, through to the CEO, to right down to the guys on the, on, on the front line. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been, everybody's been recruited with that way of thinking and that mindset. Yeah. Um, Authenticity starts with the central mission of the business. It, it starts from that premise, and your customer service is tied to that core message. We all, we're all consumers, we're all customers. We know good customer service when we experience it. If as an organization you don't, you don't uh, 
you don't drive that home, that, that, that the customer is at the centre of this, then you've lost the battle before you've even started. Well, if you just look at our contact centre, so customer service, providing good service when a customer contacts you, is the absolute start point. Uh, that, that's, that, that's the minimum. Uh, that, that's, that, that's the minimum standard, right? It's not, it's not the gold standard. So once you've provided that, we then get them to tell us about the experience and what it is we can do to stop that contact actually happening in the first place, mm. Mm. right? And, and everybody in the contact centre thinks that way and then wants to see the information being collected in the right way and then acted upon and then fed back to them, you know, then you get the whole thing going. Fantastic. Well, I'm, t I'm taking Mike's point about uh, no targets and applying that to deadlines. So <laughs> I think I'll take Friday off. Um, there was one interesting point there, which is, you know, you feel you're pushing products and set, selling this Civic after the Accord or, or vice versa. And it's speaking to, it's suffering in, in automotive in particular because they run out of reasons other than servicing to, to speak to the customer after the purchase. It's the same um, in insurance. You only speak to your insurance company if you even speak to them once a year. And the other time you speak to them is when you really don't want to be speaking to them. It's when something's gone wrong. But Matt, in particular, I want to talk to you about sustaining that customer interest because, of course, that's... We talk about, you know, the, the end purchase isn't the end point, but it's when most people experience the product and still when most people are feel yeah. compelled to leave the reviews, the comments, etc. How yeah. do you sustain that, keep that relationship going? So I think there's a trend in certain, was certainly with technology products in, in particular, where w what we've witnessed and, we, and we've started seeing in other areas is the unboxing videos. That's where when they start to become really excited about the product. And I think advocacy, real advocacy, kind of starts from, from that point onwards. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't just relate to those kind of technology products. If you, if you start to engage with an audience in, a, in an emotional in, uh, work with them with, with things that they believe in an emotional context, with people that they're really behind, with a belief system, then that, then that journey keeps on going. We, we had, a, we had a, a fantastic case study of a, a particular campaign that we did where the, the, uh, the influencer who produced the content, people loved it so much and engaged with it so much and, with the, and, and got behind the brand supporting that influencer that they started doing their own kind of pastiche of that particular piece of content. And, the, and, and, and those other bits of content that they were created to mimic that, that they went viral. So what, what the brand did is they, they chose someone who had the central belief system that they they wanted to relate to inside that that customer, and they we we worked with that to, to leverage that belief system so that the so the customers really got behind it. They started believing in the brand because the brand was supporting something that they believed in themselves. Mm -hmm. And we saw that at live events where people were shouting the name of the brand at, at a live event um, to to an audience to, to to a stage. So you can keep it going. I think if you choose the right kernel of, of belief mm -hmm. and the right audience to, to just keep that customer go, uh, that, that belief system going. I think it's authenticity is at, is at the very core of this. Mm -hmm. If you work with the right people who have, uh, have the right values, then, then you can keep that customer experience going beyond the things like the, the unboxing videos, which are mm -hmm. they're great, but, but you need to go a little bit deeper, I think. Yeah. Just, just picking up on that, the purpose piece. So yeah, just picking up on the on the, the point around purpose. So we're a bank, right? We're a new bank. And um, a lot of people that joined the business used to work for old banks and we know what they're like. Um, so our purpose and our people are built to change banking for good, right? That's our purpose. Good in all kinds of different ways, but good in here. So everybody has that belief system because they came from the bank set that did the exact opposite, linked to that purpose yeah. and said, right, I want to join that organization. And that links back to my, my point around you're either customer focused or you're not. And also linked to your point around, you know, do you put the customer to the back when things are getting tough? No, they're always at the forefront. They have to be. Mm. And in terms of encouraging that comment, <coughs> encouraging things post the unboxing, encouraging a nice review of someone who hasn't been sent sales material for a second car after they've walked off the forecourt, um, I'm going to say the word once, possibly twice, and then I will not touch on it again. Has GDPR screwed all of that up? 
<laughs> who, who, anyone else concerned that GDPR is going to completely compromise their ability to, to speak to customers in this way and, and get them involved and engaged beyond the point of purchase? Oh, well done. Nobody's concerned. I'll move on. Yeah, I guess if you've got the first part, if you've got the data on the person because they bought something, then it, you can still probably communicate can you? to them. Have we checked accepted, totally well, maybe. <laughs> They've accepted uh, to it, buy, it, but any further comments is so, so tricky. For, for us, uh, as, as a website, it's very difficult because uh, we've suddenly lost all the data that we could target people and go, hey, you know what, you probably want to see this bit of content next, or if that product isn't right, why don't you read a review over here? And that's become really, really difficult. Oh, but it's us, clean right? data. It's clean data. <laughs> it's valid data. It may be small, but it's very perfectly formed. Um, I, w <laughs> I wanted to get back to this question, which, which intrigues and, and interests me, which is, again, it's the emotional customers. It's using customers to, um, to work with customers to, to get the brand message out there. And then dealing with customers who aren't perhaps necessarily doing what you'd like them to do. So whether it's the rampaging comments-itis on trusted reviews or the person who won't quit on Twitter, or, um, you know... They're essential, though. You <laughs> need those. Well, please, Because everything's tell. fantastic. People don't believe it. It's just exactly. too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. So you need the balance to show there's yeah. a real credibility. Yeah. If a brand is transparent, says, yeah. look, warts and all, this is how it is. Mm. Yeah. And then they have a mission about what they want to treat. So the brand has to have a purpose. It needs to have a truth, and it needs to stick to it. And actually, stuff will come out of the wash, but people will respect you for it. So people don't mind mistakes as long as you actually fix it with intent and you don't do it again of winning, winning, and knowing. Mm -hmm. And that's, because that's real life, that's how you are with relationships with people. Mm. So brands that kind of smooth over everything like that is just not quite right, you know. It's a kind of Donald Trump with a better haircut. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> fingers. Um, it's a really so bad example. Can you just airbrush that one? <laughs> we'll rewind. Um, so what would be your, your best practice advice then, panel, on addressing the, the darker side of the reviews and user-generated content point? Uh, for if if it's you know if it's an expert <laughs> review, well you know if, if it's someone that's a uh, that's, that's one of my team or someone that's an expert review who who uh, hasn't liked the product is is obviously getting cut. Don't just get lots of ranty emails about, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but engage. And um, we found that in the past when we've kind of posted a, a review, we kind of said this product isn't great. Um, we've actually the, the the best response we've had is companies asking us in for the next version of the product and asking our advice and giving us early access to prototypes to help them develop. Mm. Uh, and, and that, suddenly, you know, we, we have a much better affinity with that company suddenly. Mm. And you know what, we might be a little bit softer because we actually like them as well. So there, there are things like that, that that can be done. And that goes with, with consumers as well, with customers. Just always, always engage. You can't just let it go. Um, that, that just drives people mad. So just, just on that point, so we've got um, feedback on the websites, you can go on the app, you can give us feedback. We've got Revu, we've got Trustpilot, we've got the App Store. Every single review that's left, regardless of where it's left, is responded to, be it positive or negative. Um, and just to give you a, you know, bring to life the power of responding to those um, negative reviews, um, we've actually recruited customers that have had really, really negative experiences, turned that round, and then recruited them onto the custom panel. So we've harnessed a negative situation and taken a negative experience and taken them in-house, on board, recruited them on the customer panel, um, and now they're an advocate and they're testing our product. Fantastic. And on that positive note, I think I'd like to throw open uh, the floor to, to you and see if you've got any questions you'd like to ask of our esteemed panel. Go on. You can do it. Can I? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you, if you were taking the um, employees from Well, we didn't because they were working for the old banks, but they didn't really want to work for the old banks. They knew there was something not quite right, but they didn't know, well, they'd not found something that was you know, going to replace that. And so a lot of the people have the same values, regardless of whether they work for an organization that they didn't believe in, um, but they've got to pay the mortgage, right? Um, and then Atom comes along, and all of a sudden, they found a bank who actually fits their belief system. So fundamentally, they haven't changed. Why are they staying in the old bank? Why are they going to some other industry? I can't believe you were able to change them. 
Yeah, because they've got to they've got to earn money and they've got to pay the mortgage. They've got bills to pay. Um, and some people, you know, from a cultural perspective, you can be part of a bad culture, right? but and you know that it's perhaps not quite right. But sometimes, you know, leaving is uh, is easier said than done for some. Yeah. Well, it's a related question um, around the two perspectives on. Um, the customer and how obsessed you can be with it. Do you think that it's control of the supply chain, a lack of control of the supply chain and the value chain that makes it harder in car city and in automotive, as you said, because you, you, you can't. You know, so people that are looking after brands, and it's the same, I guess, with manufacturing and retail, you just can't influence all the way through, so you kind of end up having to give up, or it's harder, whereas where you're starting with blank sheets of paper, you can can actually rewrite the rule book a bit. Do you think that has something to, to, to do with how much easier it is for, for Atom than it is for Honda? Uh, I think there's a little bit of that, absolutely. You know, with startup, you can start fresh and etc. etc. But I think the banking industry is very much like the car industry, right? It's, it hasn't really had to work that hard for its customers, right? Both of them have got a monopoly. Or they walk, or you've got you know, somebody who drives a Honda and they've you know, driven a Honda for the last 20 years. And I would argue that that, you know, reliance on delivering a customer uh, customer experience because it's easy to do, you know, drives the kind of behaviours that we've discussed. You know, apathy, uh, more, more than the supply chain, I would argue. <coughs> it's interesting from a, so, I mean, I painted a picture about the dealer network because they're independent, they can call their own shots. Part of my background was in sales and I used to look after all the independent dealers in for Honda uh, across the UK. And there were three different groups. The bigger the groups, you like multi-franchise, like the Reg Vardys, uh, this one of Pendragons. Then you had these kind of mini groups, and then you had the independents that were independent people that set up their business. They were owner drivers, as we call it. Their mortgage on their back, and they were in that dealership. And they were largely in communities which are either rural or had the kind of, you know, sort of more suburban. And they were outstanding. They were far better than any manufacturing group. They were so good in terms of customer satisfaction at any indexing, they blew everyone else out of the water. Not just satisfaction, but profitability per model. The whole business was far more robust because they were in it and they lived and breathed it. The biggest problem for manufacturers is if they decided to change the brand name on the door, the customers would go, well, I'll go with the dealership. Whatever the brand is they sell, I'm buying from them. Honda wasn't actually as important. And that's a big kick up the backside for manufacturers. So they can be extremely good in terms of those touch points, but it's the inconsistency that's really difficult for manufacturers. And the problem is with every other part of the touch point is too many people in different departments that have got a slice of the budget have their agenda, their program, their mission, their time scale. So we tend to communicate with our frequency on our format about our messaging, and it doesn't matter who the customers are, it's just this is how we do our thing. And that's why it becomes a really annoying for customers because dealers are doing it, manufacturers are doing it, and anyone else in between that thinks, Christ, we better drum up a program, we've got some surplus budget. And it just becomes a mess. So the customer doesn't know where they stand. So it, we don't own the votes for, but sometimes the part of the business that we have least control over can actually be stronger than the bits we do control. That's the paradox. Interesting. Do we have any more? Questions from the floor? There's space for a couple more. Hello. Um, really loud. <laughs> from the early days of Apple Bank and the feedback, did um, the feedback sort of help justify some of the product changes or did that lead to the product changes? Uh, no, it led it led the changes. It led the changes. Because we were, you know we're capturing you know the type and the frequency of the feedback. And then, you know, back to what I was talking about previously, you know, how does that feedback match to the things that matter most to customers so is it making it more difficult rather than easy uh, for example right is it, and if, if the answer is yes and there's lots of it then that data then feeds into the product teams which then feeds into the change agenda um, but like I said, I'm, I feel in a really fortunate position that I didn't have to push this information on right I've got Mark saying what are our customers saying what are the things that really matter to them and how are we performing from the customers perspective so that information then feeds up to Exco, it gets discussed, we talk about what we're going to do, and then we go fix it. Yes? How do you deal with the, with the bias of the self-selecting group? So the people who call your call centre are probably the people who find it more difficult to use an app in the first place, and that's externally, whereas the people who aren't calling you find it just fine and everyone's more functional. No, general. general. 
Yeah, so back to what I, you know, I was talking about the things that matter most. The things that matter most to a server are I, how, what, what interest am I getting? Right? Is my money working for me? Right? And if you then apply some of the other things that matter to general customers, such as can you make it easy and simple and straightforward? So if you've got a server that's downloaded the app, is relatively tech savvy and it just works straight through, but they get a great rate. Right, it's perfect because they don't need to contact us. All they have to do is download the app, they get the rate that they need, and the next time that we're, we're going to come in contact with that customer at some point will be as we get up to renewal. So, yeah, to your point in terms of our proposition and our app and the fact that we've got a really low cost base so we can offer brilliant rates kind of takes care of, of those guys. Um, for the customers that are less tech savvy, um, that maybe didn't contact the contact centre. We spend a lot of time on self-help guides. So YouTube videos, talking through biometrics, posting them on YouTube and then sending them out in marketing emails, for example. Any further questions? Or Martin, you want to add something? No, I was just saying, uh, sorry, uh, random thoughts. I was just thinking uh, um, sometimes it's really difficult for customers to avoid the content that comes at them and it, it the brands are attempting to engage, and actually what they're doing is really pissing people off. But people stick with it because they still want the product, mm. but they actually don't care. And there will come a point where something else will come along, and there's no reason to stay. And that's a really delicate balance. Um, and I think it's difficult with commodities where bank rates might be better, or savings rates, etc. There has to be, what are the core reasons underneath it that, that are reasons to stay? Because if you get those right, people will pay more to stay because they don't want to take the risk of having a worse experience elsewhere. So it goes way beyond price. And that's one of the issues with, and that's one of the challenges for Nissan, is it recognised everyone knew the brand name, but there was apathy, no one gave it down. So they wanted to really shift the brand model and get people to care and you know, reasons to believe. But there's just this disconnect between the strategy was laid down and then the behaviours that you default to. So you have a three year plan, and then you have a three week kind of panic and everything just gets stripped and pulled out and you never break the cycle. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, sometimes it can take too long for the senior stakeholders to go, let's stick with this mission, let's really drive the customer agenda, let's make every touch point seamless and carefree and a reason to really believe in this product and brand and never want to leave us. Mm -hmm. They go, yeah, but I'm in front of the chairman next quarter and it's looking a bit wobbly I might not have the job in three years, so what do I care about the long term? Yeah. So there's a kind of lip service, there's this sort of wheel that keeps going round and round. It's interesting the point you make, and it's, it's something you described, Mike. I think when I was talking earlier, saying, well, do we have to get the other stakeholders involved, your dealers, do we have to convince them not to be you know, funneling customers the wrong way? Perhaps we shouldn't actually be worrying. Maybe the dealers do actually know what they're doing. Perhaps we need to go straight to the top and go speak to the chairman and say, unless you start talking the way Mike's chairman starts talking, you will be out of business because there will be somewhere better to go. Um, sorry, I'm taking over again. Are there any Twitter questions? We've had hundreds. <laughs> so I'm going to pick the best one. <laughs> um, oh, mum. In the customer journey, where does influencer marketing end and advocacy begin? Oh. So I saw someone nod quite quickly. So yes, could, social could you, circle. Could you re could, sorry, could you repeat that? So. So, in the customer journey, yep. where does influencer marketing end and advocacy begin? Where does influencer marketing end and customer advocacy begin? <laughs> I think we're all influencers, aren't we? I mean, the customers are influencers. I mean, you can, you can say an influencer marketing campaign, where, where does that end? I mean, it, it can blossom. It can, it can take its own life where, when when people engage with the content or, or, or start to spread that content. But I think we're all, we're all inherently influencers. Our, our opinions spreading out through our community. You can call it an influencer marketing campaign, but sometimes what you're trying to do with influencer marketing is you're trying to throw a rock into a, into a pond and then seeing what, what sort of waves are created by that to try and spin off opinion. So I, I, I don't think there's, I think they're seamless. I think they just expand out. So if I were playing devil's advocate, um, I'm not disagreeing with you by the way, it's, so Nissan, 5% market share across Europe, so 95% of people don't ever buy the product, so they don't technically give a damn. 
that's not true. And I have a belief that advocacy isn't just those that actually part with their cash. There is a non-buying advocacy. So if you get that messaging right, those people will influence others because they respect your brand. So it could be people in a bar, at a restaurant, whatever, just chatting, and somebody says, I'm thinking of buying one or two of these make, uh, brands of car, or it could be anything. And someone else just chips in that may not own that product or brand <coughs> and says, I hear good things about them, or I like what they're about. Yeah. If that person respects that person's view, bang, it goes in. So I love Volkswagen, and particularly Volkswagen Golf, because my dad had one. And I grew up thinking, that's never wrong. Therefore, it's just embedded. Yeah. Forget the logic, and it's a pretty great advertising yeah. over the years. But the other side of it, I have a real, I'm fairly down on the whole influence of things. If you have to, and I don't mean natural influences, I think that's part of the advocacy that comes with the respect that people give your brand, either as an experience or what they perceive, uh, and what they know your values to be. But buying influence, you know, it's a bit like, I think that's just they try, the big brands are trying to shortcut, fast track their way to credibility. And I think that's really flawed, because it either says, I'm being oversimplified, it either says you don't know where you're going and you're not really sure or you think it's a cheap way of getting there. But there was a time putting a money behind Tiger Woods would have been the safest bet in the world and that can destroy brands. There's even bigger twists if you go to things like Trustpilot or what happens if you can't trust Trustpilot? What happens if that falls apart? If something is, comes out of the woodwork down the line, then does that mean anyone that's ever said anything about the brands it's represented the whole thing can start to fall apart. So out of everything the brand does, is it's got to be clear to its mission, stick to it, and be true, be honest, have that purpose, everything I talked about before, and you'll come good. If you have to buy it off the shelf, it's already flawed. It's already gone wrong, because you don't really believe it yourself. And you're expecting consumers, and I think they're getting more cynical about you know, people pushing stuff on their own social media, going, well, if they like it, then I like it. I think, it's, I think that's crumbling fast with credible customers, and it's not sustainable, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I, 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 definitely. Sorry, if I can take it because it was my excellent question. <laughs> 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 how, how we define influence, and I was thinking about paid for influence. Yeah, yeah. Please take the point about yeah. um, uh, about if it's if it's broken it's yeah. you have to start to take it, if you have to start paying for it. I, I disagree in terms, I think it's a lot, it's a long, selecting, and then I think the, which is my bit about Atom, it's about the purpose and it's about the long it's about long term relationships and about influence. And it's about relevance. If you can find an influencer that uh, that your brand has an affinity with and you're there for the long term, then I think influencer marketing has a has an enormous uh, enormous legs and a very long a, a very big future. Uh, if it is about buying uh, I think um, Kim Kardashian uh, Kim Kamar yeah. things like So for me, advocacy begins once a customer touches what you're talking about, right? And it actually experiences an organisation that really passionately cares about its, about its customers. Um, and you can't buy that, right? That's a cultural piece. And again, you've either got it or you haven't. You know, you can try and buy it, to your point, but the chances are it's not going to come through very authentically. It's about the quality of your product as well, and it's about not, not over-promising and under-delivering, which yeah. often happens, and that, that it, you're immediately on the back foot then. Um, so it's about, you know, how you message, message that as well. And we talked about, we talked about price, so for us, I've mentioned price, but price is the icing on the cake for us, right? It's an output, it's a byproduct, because we don't have any branches. But what we've got is a brilliant app experience, so we, you don't have to go into a branch and fill in a bloody million forms, right? We do it all around the back end via ID and V. You know, mortgages, right? Mortgages, how, you know, who's taken a mortgage out recently? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, mortgages have got a terrible re reputation. Do right? you do mates rates? Just <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not, but we, have, we do have some of the best rates on the market. <laughs> <laughs> don't need mates. Download the app. <laughs> <laughs> But um, 
so you, 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 you go you, you go to a broker, you get recommended. If you, if you come to Atom, you know, you'll get your decision in principle, um, not in six weeks or eight weeks. What do you think the record is for getting a full mortgage application through to a decision in principle at Atom? How long do you think it took us? 15 seconds. Is that open banking? Computer says no. no. <laughs> 15 seconds. Right? Because we're using tech, we're not using open bank because open bank is predominantly down the current account route. But, um, you know, we talked about the things that really matter to customers. Right? Don't spend ages getting to a decision on whether you're going to give us a mortgage or not. Right? You've got all my information. Use that information and get me a decision quickly. However, you know, if, whatever that decision is, if it's a yes or it's a no, get me a quickly. Fantastic. Well, I was going to ask them to wrap up with the top three or four things to say when you're dealing with customer advocacy, but we got uh, we got uh, influencer marketing, we got authenticity, we got culture, we got be the product. <laughs> any any final thoughts as we wrap up? I've got one thing to share. So um, we talked about culture, and if you've got a culture where you know people don't really believe that it's a good thing to focus on the customer, I've got I've got a Let's test the audience. So, who, when they were young, had a bad experience with alcohol? <laughs> right. I still have them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that first one, that, oh, really, that yeah. really, really yeah. bad one, yeah? yeah? Everybody. And can you remember the drink it was that gave oh, yes. you that bad experience? Uh, yes, you would. Uh, yeah, and and oh. how long did it take you before you touched that drink again? Yeah. Never. Never, Never, right? And that's because it registered in there, right? It's a systematic event, right? And I would argue that every time a customer or a prospect touches your brand in some way is going through a similar thing. It's a biological reaction, right? And I've got a Cinzano moment. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was Cinzano for me. Yeah, yeah. it was Chin Burgundy, Cinzano think, Rosso when, when I was about 14, nicked it out of my mouth, yeah. cabinet, off I went over the field, never touched the thing again, right? Just talk about those moments, right? They matter, they're real, right? They're biological. And those events are happening all the time across your brand, every time a customer, a customer touches them. So if somebody says to you, right, the customer doesn't really matter, let's put them in a box because product and are we hitting the target matters. Um, just remember Chinzano. Fantastic. <laughs> On our Chinzano moment, I think we've, we've hit the magic hour and I'm going to liberate everyone to have networking and drinks. But before we go, could we please put our hands together for our wonderful panel yeah. and our wonderful audience. Thank you. Chinzano <laughs> <laughs> stops the plummet overnight. Yeah. Sorry, anyone? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank Sorry, you so sure. much, everyone. I Thank was. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Thank you. 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 Thank you.